Welcome to this program in the Our Finger Lakes History Series. I am Seneca County historian Walter Gable. The topic of this program is ice harvesting in the Finger Lakes in years past. From 1800 to 1920, nearly every community in the northeastern United States that was near fresh water harvested ice. The ice harvesting normally took place during the months of January and February. At its peak, the American ice industry harvested around 8 million tons of frozen water annually. This harvesting of ice was very important because people relied on ice boxes and home delivered ice for domestic refrigerators. The first practical household refrigerator was sold in 1915, but refrigerators as we take them for granted today did not become popular until the 1930s. Where did people in the large cities like New York City, Boston, and Philadelphia get their ice in the later 1800s and early 1900s? Since there was no large body of pure, fresh water in these urban areas, New York City turned northwestwards to the clear, clean water of the Finger Lakes. By 1850, New York City alone used 300,000 tons of ice a year. In, in 1880, the cities of the United States had a per capita consumption of ice of about two-thirds of a ton of ice. By 1900, ice was as essential in summer as coal was in winter. Ice was harvested in the Finger Lakes right up until the late 1930s. At the height in 1886, more than 2 million tons of ice was harvested. It would take scores of men and horses and scores of boats and railroad cars to get the ice harvested and get it to the major cities. In 1907, about 15,000 tons of ice were cut from Cayuga Lake and shipped to New York City by railroad freight cars. As for expense to the household family, 25 pounds of a block of ice delivered four times a week to a household cost about $2 a month. As Americans wanted more for their tables than dried and salted meats, ice became an important commodity in this country. Ice was very important to the meat packers in the West. Ice was also important for shipping milk and fruits from the Finger Lakes to the New York City metropolitan areas. Before there were refrigerated railroad cars as we know them today, Ice was packed around the perishable items placed in railroad cars. The Romulus train station was 335 miles from the Lehigh Railroad's Jersey City Terminal for the expanding New York City metropolitan market. And that Romulus was just about the furthest distance from the New York City metropolitan area that milk could be shipped overnight without spoiling. In 1895, a total of 172,726 cans of milk were shipped out of the Romulus train station, packed with ice. They were transported in specially built refrigerated cars that carried the milk in 40-quart cans or in 12 one-quart glass bottles, packed in a wooden case, which was then packed in ice. In addition to milk, other agricultural products were shipped from Seneca County on these daily milk trains. The products included butter, cream, cheese, eggs, potatoes, apples, and other fruits, onions, and dressed meat. What I've said for Romulus was also true for many railroad shipping points in the Finger Lakes. Now, why were they making use of ice from the Finger Lakes and other parts of upstate New York? The ice of upstate New York was highly praised 
because it was usually cleaner, harder, and slower to melt. In a January 13, 1868 diary entry, Edward Morgan of Aurora on Cuga Lake reported that the ice on Payne's Creek was so clear that one could read a letter through the two and a half foot thickness of the ice. To meet the ever increasing demand for ice, har harvesting of ice was done on ponds, rivers, as well as the Finger Lakes themselves. The tools used for ice harvesting changed over time. Initially, there were just some simple hand tools, such as what are shown here in these two visuals. Starting with this slide, I'm going to go through the steps in ice harvesting. Of course, before even the first step could take place, we have to have the ice thick enough to merit being harvested, as well as thick enough to support the horses and the men that would be doing the ice harvesting on the frozen surface. This usually meant that the ice had to be at least 12 inches thick, and that usually didn't happen until sometime in January. The first step shown here was frequently needed, the step of clearing off the snow on top of the ice. Snow had to be kept off the ice because the snow formed a blanket that would not allow the ice to freeze solidly. If the snow was light and dry, a clearing scraper was used. In this visual, I have placed a red arrow to the left to point out the man using a clearing scraper. The scraper consisted of boards assembled in such a way as to provide a flat bottom and an angled back that slanted away from the bottom. It was usually eight feet wide and pulled by a horse. The operator stood on the tailboard of the scraper so as to gather just enough snow that it did not spill over the top of the plank. Heavier, wetter snow was removed by a means of a scoop scraper, shown at bottom right. The scoop scraper was only three feet wide and was then followed by the clearing scraper. The second step in the ice harvesting process was, was called marking the field of ice to be harvested. To create a baseline, men drove two stakes into auger holes about 200 feet apart at the edge of the field of ice to be cut. The men then placed a long plank fitted with sights in line with the stakes and ran a, and ran a hand plow close to the edge of the planks, cutting a groove in the ice about one-half inch deep. When this line was completed, the men then scribed the first cross line in the same manner. These grooves served as guides for the ice marker, which had a row of teeth as you see in this visual. The teeth of the marker were placed in the previously scribed groove and pulled along its entire length deepening the groove to two inches. Third step, once the ice field was marked, it then had to be plowed. This step was done by a horse-drawn plow. Each tooth of the plow was set to cut one quarter inch deeper than the tooth in front of it. So one troop with this eight tooth plow would deepen the groove by two inches. Multiple trips to two plows could deepen the grooves to seven inches, which was a sufficiently deep enough groove to harvest ice blocks that were 12 inches thick. A 12 inch thick block of ice was the most common thickness for the retail trade. Fourth step, when the plowing had created a deep enough groove into the ice to be harvested, that ice had to be separated from the rest of the ice sheet. A common way to accomplish this was to use a saw, like what is shown in this visual. 
The person would place the saw blade into the grooves marked into the eye section and saw down so that the eye section was completely separated from the rest of the ice. The next step was to get the ice being harvested floated to the shoreline where it would be brought up out of the water. Here you see four rows of ice being harvested. Such a section of ice was called a float. In this visual you see several teams of workers preparing sections of ice floats. Once these floats got to the shoreline, each float could be cut up into several blocks of ice, which then could be loaded up and placed in the ice houses. This is a scene of using horses to haul ice on Seneca Lake in 1912. Here is a picture of ice harvesting on Cuca Lake, probably around the year 1900. You will see in the hands of the various workers some of the tools that were used. The ice saw it left and then the various poles and bars used. The ice blocks were loaded onto the sled and the horses then pulled the loaded sled to the ice house on shore. In more recent years, however, powered equipment could be used to put up or cut ups, excuse me, sections of ice. Here is a picture of the conveyor being used to haul ice up into the ice house shown in the background. This is another picture of ice being hauled up a more simple conveyor into the ice house. In the ice house itself, layers of blocks of ice were covered with sawdust as an insulation to help keep them from melting. Every February up until 2000, through 2019, the Tully Area Historical Society, with the help of the Draft Horse Association, sponsored a demonstration of ice cutting using the antique ice harvesting tools. One person said, we got anywhere from 330 to 200 people attending, depending on the weather of the day, said Ron Luschinger, one of the event's organizers. If it's 35 degrees and sunny, we get 200. And if it's 5 degrees and windy, we'll get a handful of people. The event was held each year to commemorate the ice harvesting industry that flourished in the Tully area throughout the early 1900s until the early 1900s. People harvested ice from the surrounding lakes, stored it in ice houses, and then shipped it by railroad to New York City and beyond. Tully was a prime spot for ice harvesting because it had so many lakes and ponds and was a railroad town. Unfortunately, there will not be an ice harvesting festival this year of, 19, of 2020 in Tully. Until well into the, the 1920s, ice houses were a common feature in communities. Ice houses varied in size, but the typical ice house had a plank floor and double walls. Sawdust was used for insulation. The best ice houses had a shrinkage from 10 to 30% between cutting and delivery of the ice, depending on its circumstances, such as insulation, humidity, moisture, and drainage. Families typically had their own ice house, ice house. A family ice house was typically wooden and about 10 by 10 feet. In the family ice house shown in this visual, you know, will note that the lower portion was used as a cool storage area for cans of milk and even some meat. Many communities in the Finger Lakes had ice house companies. Sodas, for example, had four different ice companies. Maybe that should not be surprising when you consider that the ice could be shipped on Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River to eastern cities. 
Geneva had several ice companies. The Geneva Ice Company started operation in 1892, making use of ice harvested on Cayuga Lake. This company also accessed Cuca Lake ice from the Cuca Ice Company. By 1905, there were four ice companies in Geneva, leading to serious competition between them. The independent ice company served Geneva from 1905 to 1935. Shown in the picture is the Charles Brady's Filtered City Water Ice Company, which operated in Geneva from 1921 to 1949. The advent, however, of modern-day refrigerator freezers and sophisticated ice-making machinery spelled the end of ice-harvesting business here in the Finger Lakes. We are left with fond memories of scenes like what is shown above. I want to acknowledge the Sodas Point Historical Society and the Finger Lakes Times for use of much of the information and visuals in this program. I have, hope you have enjoyed this program on ice harvesting, which is part of our Finger Lakes history.